And can you tell us where you worked before you came to Kent? Ah, good question. I thought you'd know yeah, the answer to this. <laughs> I've worked at so many different places. Okay. So before I worked, before I started teaching and researching at Kent, I used to run my own sports massage clinic. And then before that, I used to teach uh, sports massage and anatomy and physiology. And then before that, I was working at the Royal Opera House as a sports massage therapist. Right. Yeah. I've also been a musician. I have worked for uh, the Princess Trust. I've worked in Eastern Europe. I have worked in many different roles. <laughs> okay. So what kind of people have you actually had hands-on experience okay. with? So hands-on experience, a whole range of people, ranging from very sedentary people who uh, complain about uh, neck pain or back pain, um, elite athletes, serious recreational athletes, singers, dancers, few musicians, um, a, whole, a whole range of people. Who do you think is more at risk of developing an injury? A cleaner or an office worker, oh, a musician man. or a sportsman person? Gosh, okay. So this is the million dollar question. Yeah. And it's not always the occupation or it's not always the movement pattern which predicted. It could even be related, for example, um, how did this person move as a child? How did this person develop their movement patterns as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an adolescent? Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily how we are within a certain time frame which make us more or less likely of injury. It's the whole history which has come before. Intense training, repetitive work, um, not moving at all for a certain period you know, because of injury, for example, mm. and then suddenly training very intensively. So some people cope very well with those changes. Some people are better at coping with an increase of load, an increase of training, an increase in manual work. That other could come people. down to fitness levels and genetics yeah. and previous training. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And history, you know, how adaptive are you at coping with an, with an increased load? Um, saying that, um, under-training, over-training, um, developing compensation patterns from a very early age, all those things could be precursors. I started answering your question and then I forget what the actual question was. <laughs> so if ever I'm not answering your question, I will ask please again, ask me right? again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's happened before. Thinking back to your time working with musicians, can you estimate how common injuries were? How many of them were likely yeah, to get an injury? It's really interesting working with musicians because they, in my experience, they don't classify them as injuries. Really? So yeah, yeah. So uh, they might present with pain, with chronic pain, but they may not think of it as an injury as such. It is because tissues are damaged, but many musicians will just play through it and will you know, self-medicate the same with athletes. They'll go through a period of self-medication, they'll go through a period of trying to adapt because they don't want to miss, miss rehearsals, they don't want to miss... It, it is in the very, very late stages of an injury that you're likely, that I was likely to see a musician. So I never really saw any musicians who would come to me and say, um, my elbow has been really playing up for about a week or a couple of days. No, no, no. This elbow was playing up for years and years and years. That actually reminded me that no, you didn't answer one of the questions. <laughs> yes, ask me again. How common are injuries amongst the elite musicians? I have no idea. Okay. I'll have to, we'll, we'll have to look at some papers. We'll have to look at some. Well, I've done that. Oh, you have? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, have I no wanted idea. your sort of. Yeah. Because it's, I'm so idea. biased. Because, of course, as far as I'm concerned, it was 100%, but that was the 100% of the people that I would see. Do you see what I mean? Because I, I, can't, I can't tell, because I wouldn't see the ones for whom it wasn't a problem. 
the people that I saw were the ones for whom it was a problem and for whom the pain quite often would have become so bad it didn't just affect them during the music that they were performing but in daily life as well. So what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think so, we've established that that question is not going to be answered. Okay. Oh, yes, you because asked you said, me how I many. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. What do you think about asymmetrical postures? Ah, uh, again, super hot topic <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so, when you think of a asymmetrical physiology in an athlete, so, for example, tennis players will have their dominant side will obviously be a lot more muscular, they'll be, be able to put a lot more forces through that. Their contralateral side, the opposite side, will still be strong. Particularly tennis players do lots and lots of weight training these days in order to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. But you will still notice this. Now, asymmetrical postures are really interesting in how the body, how the connective tissue system responds to that. It's incredibly intelligent. So it will compensate. It will compensate from your lower body, say your shoulder to your hip, to your knee, to your ankle, and it works. In my experience, and this is more from sort of practitioner point of view, because I don't have research data from this, this is just me working with people, is that it tends to work diagonally. There are these diagonal patterns which develop, patterns of tension which develop when people hold asymmetrical postures for a long time, mm -hmm. whether that's in sport or music or computer or factory. The main sort of body of people that I would see in my clinic were people for whom that was a problem. That it was, and that's, you know, because they were in pain, so it did develop as a problem. So, so you have worked with plenty of people who have had problems because of asymmetry. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the guitarist footstool? For some people, it's kind of so much part of their practice mm. that I never, maybe I never had the confidence or I never had, I would say, come on, let's, let's get rid of that footstool. But I would try and encourage them to think of different ways, particularly if they had kind of hip or low back or shoulder, you know, if there was something that was hurting and something wasn't, wasn't quite right. Um, sometimes I might say, okay, so what I would like you to do is just to stand and maybe I would give them, for example, a towel and say, okay, now just stand on one towel and how does that feel and how does your balance feel and how, so just to kind of make them more aware of where they are in space. Sometimes they would get rid of it themselves. When I met you, you said that um, gym goers still had sticky tissue. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with uh, connective tissues sticking? That means um, if the connective tissues, for example, between two muscles, stuck together, then those two muscles act as one unit. It's quite common on the hamstrings. Mm. And really the idea is that one of the reasons why all those muscles are in different bags is because they have slightly different functions. Mm. So they're not meant to just function as a unit, as one, as, as, as one unitary unit or as a bunch. They're meant to function and slide to some extent over each other. It also affects the amount of tension which is in the fascia. So all our, our whole body is under a certain amount of tension, um, which is which is held and con not controlled, but is regulated by the connective tissue. And some people, for example, people who um, are bedridden or people who just don't move a lot, the tissue is stiffer and it has less of a sliding capacity. So that sliding capacity is absolutely crucial. And connective tissue loves that. It does, does not want to be stayed, but does not want to be forced into one position for mm -hmm. a long period of time because that's when fibrosis happens. That's when all kinds of cell-to-cell -cell communication happens within the joint capsules, within the 
because the body starts to think, okay, something is wrong. Something is really wrong because this person is not moving. <laughs> <laughs> Let's send some more connective tissue layers there and you get fibroblasts. I'm just thinking about frozen shoulder, for example, adhesive capsulitis. And then if we stop moving and we keep doing that for years and years and years, it starts to think that um, some, something's wrong. We need to protect mm -hmm. it. Quick, let's send some collagen there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's do some contracture. Let's bring, so bring not using together. the joint makes the body think the joint is being avoided because there's a problem. Yeah. So yeah. it stiffens yeah. it up. Yeah. That's well. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And that's when you get fibrosis. I suppose if somebody actually has adhesion, then they're probably going to notice that there's a problem. Not necessarily. So okay. So if you're, if you think, I don't want this to happen. What, what would I have to do to ensure that if I've got any bits that are starting to stick, they don't stick? Movement. Just do as much moving as. Absolutely. You can. Absolutely. Variation. Different surfaces. Um, yeah. So whether it's gardening, whether it's going for a run, going for a swim, dancing. So any sort of full body, full range movements is a good thing. Absolutely, yeah.